This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows Granger's got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Or, for the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. The following program are pre recorded Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. You're tuned to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bach, along with Kevin Oberlander, Dakota Pharmacy, Dakota Natural Health Center, downtown Bismarck's Corner Drugstore. Uh, welcome, Kevin. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, mushrooms. We are going to talk some, about mushrooms. Some fungus among us. Yep. yep. Now, it's kind of funny because when you brought this up as a topic, um, and people are a lot of, you know, whether it's athlete's foot, jock itch, toenail fungus, you know, people are familiar with fungus. Right. Fungal infections is actually overall very, very bad and hard to get rid of. Yeah. But one of the first things that popped into my mind is, you know, and, and I buy supplements and, and so I'm always looking at, at supplements and, and what I've noticed over the last year or two, uh, you're seeing a lot of mushroom supplements. This is something I have not seen on the store shelves for ever. Um, but they seem to be popping up now because there must be some benefit with them. Yeah, you know, we, we see some mushroom extracts in some of our, you know, multiple layer products. Um, last Friday, I had a, a gentleman walk in the pharmacy and he asked, asked us if we had Ganoderma. And I had no idea what he was talking about. So in um, 80 years of being a pharmacist yeah. or, or 90 or whatever it is now that you were stumped. I, w- I was stumped. So I quick looked it up. Um, and it's actually one of the reishi mushrooms. And I've heard of reishi. It's in a couple of the products that we have. But I realize I don't know a lot about mushrooms. So do they come in pieces? Yeah. Are they reishi so, pieces? Yeah, stems. <laughs> reishi pieces? So what, you, what, what I really enjoy about coming in on Thursday mornings is the research that I do to be prepared. So you do I, a lot of homework. You, Kevin comes in with a stack. Yeah. And so no matter what direction we may go with the conversation, I can you, find it. You can find it. <clears throat> yeah. So I started doing some reading and I did did a fair amount of research on and off this week about medicinal mushrooms. Um, and I thought, yeah, there's a subject here. So that's that's where we're going. Well, and I was familiar with them at Asian medicine. Sure. They, they've been around for centuries and sure. centuries and centuries but has kind of stayed in that space uh with with asian medicine yeah as you're as you'll hear in a minute there's many cultures that use mushrooms in their in their medicinal world and we'll, we'll kind of go through that um i find it interesting anytime there's a quote-unquote food that really has a medicinal property so hippocrates um said whenever let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And, and a lot of the medicines, modern medicines we use, really originate in nature. You know, they, they're, they're originally from, say, a, a plant. You know, you look at our cholesterol well, drugs. And we've talked about this yeah. in the past, getting back to the roots of compounding. It was really about roots. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah, was it, a lot of, it, it, it was it, the plants in nature. It was. So looking into mushrooms and the medicinal properties and, and of course, as, as we get modernized, we're getting, you know, very pure extracts from the mushrooms. Um, I think mushrooms are probably a good thing to have in our diet as long as you're not having problems with ingesting a fungus. Um, the first thing I thought of was what you mentioned was agent. So TCM is traditional Chinese medicine. It's kind of probably has the longest history in, in the use of mushrooms. Um, it dates back thousands and thousands of years. In fact, Ganoderma is one of the most well-known medicinal mushrooms in traditional Chinese medicine. And that's what I found when I looked up Ganoderma as a reishi mushroom. 
it took me right to traditional Chinese medicine because it's very, very prevalent in that. But there's, but there's other cultures, Ayurveda. Ayurveda medicine originated in India. And Ayurveda is the skill of putting together multiple things to get a positive outcome. So Ayurveda is the, kind of the science of synergy. Things work really well together. Layered approach. Yeah, yeah. Um, so various mushrooms use an Ayurveda that put it, they, they put us medicinal properties. So cordyceps, cordyceps, and we're going to go through these in, in greater detail. Cordyceps is very, very um, prevalent in Ayurveda medicine. It's used as an adaptogen um, to help you adapt to stress. And we've had a conversation about unresolved stress recently. Um, <clears throat> Japanese and Korean traditions use medicinal Chinese medicines. The staple for them was shiitake. We see shiitake mushrooms as part of formulas that are put together by the companies that we use. Um, shiitake is good for immune function. So in some of the immune products that we were seeing during this whole COVID time, some of them had some sh- shiitake mushroom extract in it. And it's in there, but I didn't really do my homework until this week. So well, and it's, it, when it's, I was, so it, was an istri- it was an interesting... When week. I was skimming through stuff, it, it, so <clears throat> mushrooms, Native American culture, yeah, um, very prevalent. Um, also, uh, I found some stuff in Egyptian. Uh, there were some references to Egyptian medicine sure. that, that were there. I'm like, wow, that, that okay. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and we're not talking about the, the psilocybin... The, no. the hallucinogenic. <laughs> no. Uh, no, that, that that's not a medicinal, medical. These are different. There, there's a distinct difference between the two. Well, if you look at the plant world, there are different sides to it. There, In this case, there's a medicinal side and there's a psychedelic side. Even, even, in, even in the cannabinoid world, hemp has cannabinoids, but it's touted to be more medicinal. Now, medical marijuana is touting to be medicinal, but it also has the hallucinogenic and intoxicating effect. The the interesting thing that I started to read about mushrooms is the modern scientific research, because that's typically what happens is the modern research will follow some of the ancient medicinal modalities because there's there's positive outcomes, so they're going to research why. Why are we getting a positive outcome? Um, We use Beta-glucans are very, very common. Well, beta-glucans, polysaccharides, um, triterpenoids, they're all part of our medicinal world, but they're derivatives of mushrooms. Um, I knew beta-glucans were, but I didn't know about some of the others. Fungus among us. Yeah. And then there's some good stuff out there. Yep. Uh, we're talking about uh, mushrooms and, and fungus and the different medical sides of that with Kevin Oberlander, Dakota Pharmacy, Dakota Natural Health Center, downtown Bismarck's Corner Drugstore. This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk. For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. You're tuned to Talk of the Town on Superdoc 1270. I'm Steve Biden, along with Kevin Oberlander, Dakota Pharmacy, Dakota Natural Health Center, downtown Bismarck's Corner Drugstore. And we're talking about mushrooms. So the fungus among us, and not the fungus between your toes. No, like no. Cases. So, all right, so when you're looking at a mushroom and, and you see the stem, you see the cap, there's a little bit of a root system that really you, you don't see that goes underground. Uh where the benefits come because there's different pieces to a mushroom and and uh, you know some mushrooms are rather dangerous because yes. i know people that pick them and some are good for you and, and, and but it's the different components of the mushroom that have different properties yes and uh, unless you're well schooled you don't walk around in the wild and pick mushrooms and eat them so even if i were you, no no <laughs> not gonna happen <laughs> so the mycelium is the root and the stem, it's the carrier of the nutrients to the fruiting body. That's the, the, what, what we see, you know, the majority of what mushrooms look like. But the interesting thing about mushrooms, and when we get into it deeper in this session, is 
there's many different looks to mushrooms. You know, their color and the shapes. And it's not the traditional cap that you think of. Some are, but the majority of them are really strange looking. Um, but again, it's the fruiting body that is going to carry the nutrients. And well, it, so going back to the nutrient side too, you have to remember um, mushrooms grow out of decay. Right. So that's part of some of the dangerous properties is you've got decay so it's how that nutrient is absorbed and transformed and utilized in the cap that is either dangerous or good for you. Right. And and maybe not all of the cap is actually good for you as well. So, you know, we're looking for, again, the beta-glucans, the tri, triterpenoids. Those, those are the nutrients that are in the mushrooms that have their... The, the give us the positive medical outcomes. So I just thought it was interesting the hit you know some of the history of the different kinds of mushrooms and we're gonna, we're going to talk about the top seven medical mushrooms and some of these may sound familiar to some of the audience um, and they all have kind of a subtitle. So in fact, one of them's it's the mushroom that's not a mushroom. It's actually part of a tree bark. So, really? Yeah, yeah. So my favorite mushroom. The yeah. one on my steak. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the sautéed ones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so the the top seven medical mushrooms um, include one called lion's mane. Lion's mane mushroom is mushroom for the mind, um, and it's really it it its benefits are that it supports healthy brain function and neuron regeneration. Um, we have people ask for lion's mane. I believe we do have a lion's mane mushroom. Um, extract, and that's what they're looking for. They're looking for improvement in cognitive function and focus, and um, and they buy it and they rebuy it because they 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 say that it helps. Um, histor- historically, lion's mane is it's beautiful in appearance. It's a very attractive looking mushroom. Um, it also let me gr- guess. It looks like a lion's, lion's mane. mane. I, uh, yeah, I, uh. yeah, it does. But it doesn't grow out of the ground. It actually grows on trees. So you might actually have seen shell-looking things on the barks of trees. They're probably a type of a mushroom, maybe not medicinal, but they're growing on, like you said, they're growing on decay. Yeah, some sort of a fungus. Right. And, and it, is there a difference between the definition of a, a fungus? Is it kind of like a, a square is a rectangle, a rectangle is not a square. Right. A mushroom's a fungus, but a fungus isn't always a mushroom. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that, that that's definitely true. Um, so lion, lion's mane... Um, it's very, very popular. The more I read about it, the more I found it's very prevalent in, in, in all worlds. Um, the reishi mushroom, which we talked about initially, it's a, it's a Ganoderma type of mushroom. Um, the reishi mushroom is considered the mushroom of immortality. Now, what it's typically used for is as a sleep aid and an important immune modulator. So the idea that it's for immortality is... If we sleep better, we're probably going to live longer. And if our immune function is better, we're probably going to live longer. Um, Rishi mushrooms are rich in polysaccharides. That, and it's the polysaccharides that are associated with, with improved immune function. Um, and if taken for a long time, science really shows that it can be very, very beneficial and significantly import, support your immune function. Um, cordyceps. Cordyceps is a mushroom, again, that may sound familiar. Familiar. Um, cordyceps improves lung capacity and increases energy. So lung capacity would be, pro- cordyceps might be used in somebody that has, you know, COPD, as long as it's not interfering with the medications they're on, asthma, those types of people, those Maybe seasonal allergies. You you might you might see a cordyceps mushroom extract in some seasonal allergies when lung capacity is diminished. Um, shaga mushroom is the mushroom that's not a mushroom. It's a mushroom that it's considered a mushroom, but it's not a mushroom. It's actually um, put out by birch trees. It's part of the birch tree bark, so it's more of a bark. Um, but it it's typically used to help digestion and it's good for it's good for the skin and and the idea that it's good for the skin is apparently 
the shaga mushroom is part of the birch bark because it helps protect the tree. So it's thought that that is how it originally was used because it was seen on trees and healthy birch trees. So it was assumed that it would be good for, for skin. Um, turkey tail. Turkey tail mushrooms, the mushroom of multiple colors. Um, and again, the primary function of turkey tail is it, it helps boost the immune system. Um, and it does that by increasing our natural killer cells. Um, and that's important. We want good killer cells. To boost white cells? Yeah, killer cells are T cells. They're, T cells. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're scavengers. So a killer cell is... So if there's an infection and your immune function is trying to target that, um, the bugs, we'll, we'll call them bugs, they, send, they tend to send out deflectors. To, to draw the attention of our killer cells away from the bad guy that our immune system's trying to treat. Um, your, your T cells and your killer cells, they gather up these byproducts of the disease so that our killer cells can attack the, the, the actual bacteria or, or whatever we're dealing with. So something like turkey tail is going to help with gather up those free radicals is what they're boost called. That system. They're going to boost radicals. So. They're going to okay. they're going to boost that system. Yep. Um shiitake, shiitake's the fragrant mushroom. Um apparently it has a very very pleasant odor and it's typically used to support cardiovascular health and liver health. Um and lastly, maitake mushroom is the dancing mushroom. And I found a video of a maitake mushroom and it almost looks like they're in an ocean. They're like fingers like they flutter? flowing. They flutter. Yep, yep. There's no cap. They're like fingers, um, but they're really, really cool looking. Um, and again, it's really more of a cardiovascular health, uh, blood pressure benefit, and again, immune support. Well, and the shiitake, you mentioned the fragrance on that. It, that's why they're widely used in cooking. Yeah. Because of the, the fragrance that comes with uh, the shiitake mushroom. So it, it's good for presentation it and is. good for bouquet when you're making that fine meal. Uh, we're talking like the Food Channel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have breakfast yet this morning. I'm hungry. Uh, this is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bike along with Kevin Oberlander, Dakota Pharmacy, Dakota Natural Health Center, downtown Bismarck's Corner Drugstore. We're talking about fungus and mushrooms and the health side of that. This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Talk of the Town. Talk of the t- this is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows granger has got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Bakken, weekday morning starting at 9 on Super Talk 1270 and the free Super Talk 1270 mobile app. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. You're tuned to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bakken along with Kevin Oberlander, Dakota Pharmacy, Dakota Natural Health Center, downtown Bismarck's Corner Drugstore. And we're talking about fungus, the fungus among us. We're talking about mushrooms and the medicinal health aspect of mushrooms. So, okay, like I said, I've been seeing mushrooms and mushroom extract on store shelves for a little over a year now, about yeah. a year and a half. Is it, It's really come into its own. And we talk about absorption and things like that all the time and the quality of the, these different supplements. And I picked up several of these bottles, and, and some of them are, are specific, this type of mushroom or that type of mushroom. You, but usually I'll see a mushroom extract and it'll list a few things on there. Um, I, I'm guessing the average consumer, myself included, is not going to have any clue what amounts or quality or anything as you're sitting there looking at a bottle that says mushroom extract. I've been doing this a long time, and I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> teach us yeah so one of the interesting things about mushrooms is we kind of consider them a vegetable but they're not they're not a plant or an animal they're a fungus and when we get into the next session we talk about some of the risks of mushrooms 
it's it centers around the fact that not everybody should it's a fungus it's a fungus not everybody should ingest them well and and i know people that you know one of the worst medical conditions that's out there is get a fungal infection oh yeah Uh, good luck those are hard to get rid of so you have to be very careful with fungus we've talked about biofilms fungus are very very adept at building themselves a biofilm to protect themselves now the bad fungus are um the good fungus in mushrooms really don't do much in the penetration of a biofilm. So you typically don't treat fungus infection with a fungus. Sometimes even a, even a quality fungus will exacerbate the condition because you're adding to the makeup of that biofilm. And when we talked about biofilm here not too long ago, we talked about the fact that the organisms inside the biofilm actually create antibiotics so they teach themselves how to protect themselves from antibiotics, which is a scary, scary world. And I don't know that we really know enough about mushrooms and their effect on biofilm, but I don't believe there's a mechanism there or they're not adding to to that mechanism because they're not able to break well, And quite biofilm. often, mold and <clears throat> fungus are grouped together. Yeah. And where does penicillin come from? It's mold. Mold. Yeah. So, you know, it very, you, you got to be careful. You do have to be careful. Um, and as, and as far as quality, we've talked about that all the time. I'm sure, I'm sure you can get bad mushroom extracts. I'm sure you can get some that have no medicinal quality. Um, we hear horror stories about is I'm buying a reishi mushroom and they put a, a dot of it in there. The rest is nothing, but they put it on the label cause it's got some reishi in there. So there's gotta be dosages and mounts that are medicinally proven, which is what we look to as when we when we're looking at drug uh, supplement manufacturers, we're, we're looking at their knowledge and and how long have they been doing it and their independent lab testing to prove that what is on the label is actually what's what's in the bottle. Um, but I thought we'd take this session and kind of do a, a reverse on because we talked about the mushrooms and what they might be used for. So let's do the reverse. Let's look at in um, a, a disease or some type of malady and what would be the mushrooms that would be best for that. Um, so what is the best mushroom for inflammation? Um, <clears throat> there's three that come to mind, reishi, cordyceps, and turkey tail. They show to have the most anti-inflammatory properties um, and they also support your immune system. And a lot of our, our immune function um, when, it's, when it's poor leads to an inflammatory process. Um, What's the best mushroom for joint pain? Um, Reishi mushrooms, again, come right to the top. Um, It's been shown in research that reishi can help ease pain in people with rheumatoid arthritis after about a period of 24 weeks. So it takes a fair amount of time for some of these things to actually exhibit. Um, So typically do mushroom extracts or mushrooms and their properties, does that take a a while to build up in the system? Yeah, I think it's it's not like pop the pill and a couple days later you're feeling better. Right. They're they're really not drugs. They're they're fungus um, that come from our world. And typically when people make dietary changes to improve their health, that doesn't that doesn't help overnight. You know, that just takes a while. The nutrients that we're ingesting can take weeks and weeks and months sometimes to give us a positive outcome. I think the same is to be said for using some mushrooms. So if your immune function is poor um, and you want to boost it with some mushroom extract, you probably don't want to consider that an acute problem. It's it's a long-term commitment to using that as part of your immune function. Um, so what is the medicinal mushroom that is touted for anti-aging? Because traditional Chinese medicine uses, again, reishi, um, and then the Korean, um, Japanese use shiitake and maitake as anti-aging mushrooms to slow the aging progress and maintain long, longevity. Um, what's the best mushroom to lower cortisol? So... The gentleman that came in the pharmacy last week looking for Ganoderma, again, that's a type of a reishi mushroom that helps helps control our cortisol output so it has a calming effect in in times of stress. Um, What mushroom is used for fibromyalgia? 
Um, that's a ganoderma. Again, fibromyalgia is, is oftentimes um, a, a severe inflammatory condition that travels around the body, but it's usually associated <clears throat> with a myriad of complications, one of which... <clears throat> one of, <clears throat> one of which is excessive stress. So the, the, these, mush, these mushroom extracts seem to have a calming effect on, on our system. So you, using some type of a Ganoderma mushroom may be part of a program. I don't know that if a fibromyalgia patient came in the store that I would say, here, take this and that's all you need to take is Ganoderma, but it, became, it might become part of their Could program. Could be kind of a part of a regimen. Right, right, because it, tip, it typically takes, it just takes a long time and multiple modalities to help patients like this. Um, uh, one of the questions I ran across is, what is better, maitake or shiitake? You actually see them mostly together. So they have, they have, they have different properties, um, but maitake is called the king of mushrooms, um, mostly because it actually has it has high culinary use um, as well as nourishing qualities to to the body overall um, so what in in a nutshell, what are some of the myriad of health benefits that medical mushrooms um, as nutritional powerhouses can improve um, and that list includes the top is provide immune support. They're full of antioxidants. And we've talked about antioxidants ad nauseum in the past. Antioxidants are just really, really good for you. They, 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 they help um, fend off what's called oxidative stress. So as oxidation and stress destroy cells, the cells become rusty. And antioxidants help knock the rust off. I had a friend of mine that's a, a, a chef and a nutritionist, and they described mushrooms because they cooked with mushrooms a lot. And I love mushrooms in food, so and they cook with lo- And they described mushrooms as the mitochondria of the food yeah. world. <clears throat> that, that, I'm like, well, it's very, well, that, that's pretty <clears throat> accurate. That's out. very interesting, yeah. So, and we've talked because about... Because of the antioxidant <clears throat> properties. Right, and we've talked about antioxidants in the past and the mitochondria. So the mitochondria is the powerhouse. So anything you can ingest that powers the mitochondria and mushrooms may very well be one of those things to include in in a regimen. Um, mitochondria health is all the rage right now in medicine. Um, we talked about methylene blue powering the mitochondria. In fact, I found a source of methylene blue that I think we can carry in the pharmacy. So Without turning the pharmacy blue? <clears throat> Without turning the pharmacy blue. <laughs> <clears throat> Like some labs get to be. Uh, interesting stuff. We're talking about mushrooms. Kevin Oberlander, Dakota Pharmacy, Dakota Natural Health Center, downtown Bismarck's Corner Drugstore. When we come back, I want to talk about uh, some of the dangerous side yeah. of mushrooms. Uh, you know, Again, we talked about that. You don't, unless you're well-versed, you don't walk through the woods and go, oh, look, a mushroom. I'm going to have that for dinner tonight. Um, there are some dark and dangerous sides. We mentioned the biofilm side of things. So you have to know what you're working with when you're addressing mushrooms and fungus. This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270. Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. You're tuned to Talk of the Town on Superdoc 1270. I'm Steve Eichel. I'm with Kevin Oberlander, Dakota Pharmacy, Dakota Natural Health Center, downtown Bismarck's Corner Drugstore. And we're talking about fungus, mushrooms, and uh, the effects and good effects that it can have with your health regimen. And now there's a dark side. We want to talk a little bit about that because we've talked about the biofilms in the past. Um, and mushrooms, they're a fungus. Not really a, a plant, not an animal, kind of... Just their own little they're, world. They're, they're their own little world out there. And uh, quite often you think about the fungus side of things, that although many medical benefits, because as I mentioned, uh, you know, fungus is kind of lumped in with mold and penicillin comes from mold, good molds. So there's good molds, bad molds, good fungus, bad fungus, good mushrooms, bad mushrooms. Right, right. And even good mushrooms can be bad for somebody. So when I, when I was doing my research, I found eight specific 
um, risks that patients need to consider if they're gonna if they're gonna use a mushroom extract. And the number one risk is the allergic reaction that could happen because this is something that it, it grows in the environment. Um, we can be allergic to a lot of things in our environment. So there's a there's a population of individuals that may be specifically allergic to mushrooms. And they may know that. Well, and, you know, and quite often, a lot of people that are allergic to mold because mold and mildew. And right. There's a lot of allergies out there for that. Well, again, mold is closely related to fungus, closely related to mushrooms, which so if you're allergic to an aspect of that, right. there's a good chance you're going to be allergic to a larger aspect of that. Or, or if you have long-term exposure some people have exposure to mold that they're not even aware of it can be in it can be in the house that they're living in it can be in the building that they're working in we hear that with black mold all exactly the time. That's why it's exactly. so dangerous so so if a patient's exposed to a mold on a chronic basis their immune function is probably going to be compromised to that world and that world includes the potential that they would react to mushrooms so you just have to be diligent and very careful. Um, so, you know, it's once you start something, you just kind of need to be aware. If you see some t- something that would be considered an allergic reaction, you may be reacting to it. That would be a skin rash. That's going to be like a, a runny nose or some congestion. You, tip, typical of, of your of your allergic reaction. So, you know, be aware. Um, the second most um, documented risk is there's actually a fair amount of drug interaction. So there again, I think there is a risk in people just stopping, looking at something off the shelf, picking it, taking it home, and taking it. Well, especially, but that's especially if not you're on medication, mushroom specific, because people right. that's you know, first everything. first thing they, <clears throat> when you walk into your doctor's office, okay, what medications are you taking? Well, that also includes supplements. Yes. So if you're taking supplements, those supplements will react with different medications or courses of treatment as well. And, and I, I think people take that awfully lightly. I think they do. You know, the, the, the number one type of medication that can interact with mushrooms is, is blood thinners, the anticoagulants. A lot of people take them. A lot of people use them in their cardiovascular program. And they see, well, this particular kind of mushroom is good for my cardiovascular system, so I think I'm going to take that in addition to my medications and without asking about it or asking a professional who like like our staff who can help with that if we don't know the answer we're going to look it up i didn't know the answer on friday so i went and looked it up but i think it's important that if you're you know we can look at your drug history if you get your medication from us but if you don't we don't have access to that for the most part so it the it's it, the the buyer just needs to be diligent about what they're ingesting and any risks that might be involved with that. Toxicity is another issue. Um, I don't think you ever want to take an excessive amount of a mushroom extract. Um, I also don't think, like we've talked, you just don't walk out into the woods and eat a mushroom because there's some toxicity associated with that. Um, in some cases, consuming mushroom extracts um, and these concentrated extracts, the beta glucans, the polysaccharides, can cause some digestive discomfort. Um, so sometimes starting with smaller doses and working into it so your GI tract understands what you're ingesting. So is there a danger or is there a benefit for, because like I said, I'll, I'll go on the shelf and I'll see mushroom extract. And then you look at the label and, and there's a bunch of different mushrooms in there. Or there will be a mushroom-specific extract. Um, benefits, dangers of taking that one-size-fits-all or something specific? I actually think there might be a benefit to it. Because if you look at what we talked about, there's so many of these mushrooms that really exhibit the same outcomes. Immune function, um, anti-inflammatory, um, good for the cardiovascular system um but you need to help balance your blood sugar so if you take an extract combination you're using smaller amounts of different types of mushrooms so you may lower the risk of the exposure because you might be fine with one mushroom and not another one but again you also have to be have an understanding of what medications you may be on in conjunction with those as well just like any supplement yep 
great resource. If you want more information, uh, talk to Kevin Se- and your staff. 705 East Main, Bismarck's downtown corner drugstore. Perfect. Make sure you stop on in. Uh, Dakota Pharmacy, uh, Dakota Health Center. This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Welcome to April 11th on the National Day calendar. Today, we're backing up to the era of 8-tracks and dishing up some communal melted goodness. Okay, who remembers 8-track tapes? Me? These chunky cartridges were the Spotify of the 60s and 70s, allowing music lovers to take their favorite tunes on the go. Whether you were grooving to the Beatles or dancing to ABBA, 8-tracks let the music play until they got stuck. On National 8-Track Tape Day, here's to the joy, the music, and yes, even the frustration of this vintage tech. The point is, I don't want an 8-Track Tape player. And you won't get one. Oh, but honey, he wants one. I was so cool, my 8-Track Tape player. I'm telling you. I could totally see you. Did you, like, walk down the street with it? (laughs) Not quite. You couldn't do that, but I did have a portable one where it moved from my car to the stereo in my house, so that was kind of cool. Ah, you're fancy. I was kind of fancy back in the day, I'm just telling you. (laughs) From audio tech flashbacks, let's switch to a culinary classic. Cheese fondue, with its origins in Switzerland, is all about sharing food and good times. This communal dish of melted cheese served in a communal pot is a reminder that the best meals are those served with others. So grab a fondue fork, spear some bread, and let's celebrate National Cheese Fondue Day. Just remember, double dipping is still a fondue faux pas. You had a fondue party without me? No. No. Oh, this is a great party, Karen. Yeah, I like fondue. Tastes a lot like cheese. Cheese, glorious cheese. Taste my I double dip. dip. You shouldn't eat this cheese fondue anymore. That, that does mean no good anymore for me, right? Yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and finish this. You should go get another one. Because, oh. <laughs> you know, it's a rule. You did this totally on purpose. I know you did. Can great minds think alike? <laughs> Are you serious? I'm Latoya Johnson. You don't share the cake either. I'm Marlo Anderson. Thank you for joining us on our journey to celebrate every day. And don't forget to share your 8-track tape day and cheese fondue day stories and tag us on social media. Talk of the Town, weekday morning starting at 9 on Super Talk 1270 and the free Super Talk 1270 mobile app. AM Mandan Bismarck, a Town Square media station, broadcasting from the View Community Credit Union Studio. Eat. This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Without apology, the regular Joe Show with Joe Giganti. Weekday evenings at 9 on Super Talk 1270 and the free Super Talk 1270 mobile app. Portions of the following program are pre recorded. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. Steve Bach, along with Brandon Dedloff. He is the Home Ownership Division Director for the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency. Uh, Brandon, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, I wanted to break down a lot of the home ownership stuff and, and where things are at right now because, you know, Joe and I have been talking about things all over the board and interest rates and are they coming down what the Fed's trying to do? And, okay, that's what's going on in the market. 
how do we combat some of that? And one of the hidden gems we've got in North Dakota is the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency. That is the pathway for home ownership for a lot of people. Um, give us a little background, uh, North Dakota Housing Finance Agency. Um, it, it, it has a unique role in North Dakota when it comes to home ownership. It does, yeah. And we've been around, uh, this is actually our 41st year um, we've been around. So, you know, like you said, we're kind of a hidden gem. We're, we're known about in many circles, but we're more known mainly probably with the real estate community, uh, the agents and the lenders in the community. You know, we don't originate loans directly, but we work with uh, originating lenders throughout the state that originate loans on our behalf. Um, most program everybody knows about is our first home, uh, our first time home buyer program, um, geared toward first time home buyers. Again, our our big thing is trying to combat that affordability issue um, with some of the ways we fund our loans. We're able to keep our our interest rates fairly low. Um, we can talk about that a little bit. I mean, you know. You're hearing in the news with interest rates continuing to climb, and they're you know now just over seven percent. Um, our lowest rate currently today is five and a half percent. It's almost one and a half percent below the market. Which, if you're thinking, you know, the last couple of years with interest rates they were two and a half, three percent, which now they've climbed to seven. So how do you combat some of that affordability issue um, again with our low interest rates? And again, we have some down payment assistance programs. It helps with uh, those out-of-pocket things people don't have. You're buying your first home. There's things that you need. Um, you don't have to have that traditional 20% down. Um, you know, we can get you in for as little as $500. Um, we say that to a lot of people, and a lot of people think we're crazy when we say $500. Um, I've actually talked to a couple lenders this year, some in the western part of the state, um, and some right here in Bismarck. They've had, I think, three or four buyers have actually got into a house for $500. They wow. bought a house which is amazing in this market that we're in currently, but they're still doing it. Gives you a lot of opportunity to offset uh, what that number looks like for a house payment when you're looking at that 7 7.5% yeah. interest rate, especially when you get that little bit lower rate. Uh, uh, a lot of different programs out there. And you mentioned the first-time homebuyers program, um, which is a little... It, it's kind of a misnomer because mm -hmm. people think first time home buyer. Okay, great. I bought my first house with North Dakota Housing Finance Agency, and that first time home buyers. I bought three houses with the North Dakota Housing yeah. Finance Agency first time home buyer because you can requalify after yes, a period absolutely. of time. So walk us through that. So the the say you're buying your first home and you've never had a home before, and your realtor, your lender goes, hey, here's this great program, this great agency, North Dakota Housing Finance Agency. What's the first step? So the first qualifying step to be a first-time home buyer, um, and this is actually a federal regulation way we fund, I'm not going to go into the, the craziness of how we fund our loans because people's eyes will kind of glass over, but it's basically you can't have owned a home as your principal residence in the last three years. So again, like you said, if you haven't, if you use our program, you sold it, you weren't living there as your principal resident the last three years, you qualify again. So people can use it multiple times. Had a house, sold it, you moved, whatever, and then you wind up renting for a while. Yeah, or you say, you know, um, Mary lives in Grand Forks. She moves to Bismarck, still owns that home in Grand Forks, but she's renting it. So it's not her personal residence. She hasn't lived there in three years. She qualifies again. She could buy a house in Bismarck with the first time home buyer program. See that now that's the other interesting side of it because you can own multiple homes at the same time with that first time home buyer if you've got a rental property. So uh, we're going to get into that one too, but uh, finish up on the on the somebody okay, I'm buying my first house. I go to the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency. Um, what are the steps? I so the qualification process. Yeah. So First of all, how, how do they get a hold of you? Basically, what they're going to do is they're going to find a lender they want to work with that is one of our participating lenders. So we've got about 60 we work with throughout the, throughout North Dakota. Obviously, a lot of them have multiple locations, um, but pretty much every lender in the state uses our program. Um, so that's where you're going to start to see if you qualify. They understand all our qualifications, our, you know, our parameters, income, acquisition limits, all that kind of good stuff. Um, if you qualify for that, basically what they're going to do is make sure you fit in the right program. We always tell lenders, try it through our program. If it works, great. If they don't qualify and there's another program that works better for them, that's great. Um, but that's the best place to start because we don't originate the loans. They're basically doing it on our behalf. And then once they close that loan, they then sell it to the agency. And then a big, huge point for local borrowers is we service all those loans locally. So we do not sell that anywhere. If they have questions, they call us right here from our Bismarck office. We've got 10 staff members who can answer their questions anytime from 8 to 5. Um, another good thing I love to say is we don't have a, when you call in, you're going to get a human on the line. It's not a press one, two for this. 
you're going to get somebody on the line, somebody that's local that understands maybe a problem you're having or an issue that you're having, especially first-time home buyers. There's always questions. You know, it's kind of funny because I, I remember back, and of course, first-time home owner it, it bought my first house in Grand Forks through North Dakota Housing Finance Agency, had a lot of questions, and speed dial North Dakota Housing Finance yep. Agency, and somebody always answered. Yep. And now, ironically, uh, Jolene, who used to be the director, is my neighbor across sure. the fence behind me. <laughs> but but uh, you talk about North Dakota agency and, and North Dakota roots and, and getting a, somebody who is in the same state that knows everything about what you're going through as a first-time home buyer in North Dakota you don't get that kind of service anywhere. No. You know, and a biggie is too, um, when we have insurance claims, hailstorms, you know, we've had a couple this year, you get a check from your insurance company and it has your, your mortgage company's name on it. Well, what do you do with it? Again, some of those that are out of state, it's a little difficult sometimes to deal with them. Well, us, we understand there was a hailstorm. So we can deal with that fairly quickly. We know what's going on. Again, we have people right here in Bismarck um, and we're never gonna sell that anywhere. It's always gonna be right here. So, okay, you've got the first time home buyer, you've got your qualification, what's the next step? Next step is basically um, with your, you're gonna do everything with that originating lender. Um, you're, gonna, you're gonna qualify with them, you're gonna close the loan with them, and then once it closes with them, it, we are basically buying it from the lender, which we will then obviously send information to the borrower saying where they're going to make payments, you know, how they can do that online, if they have questions, how to contact us. Yeah, I remember um, my first little book from North Dakota Housing Finance Agency. just pulled the coupon off and sent the check in. It was probably pretty... hasn't changed a whole lot other than a lot more people are doing it online now. Online now, yeah. 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 Uh, you know, we're talking with uh, Brandon Detloff. He's the Home Ownership Division Director at North Dakota Housing Finance Agency. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about how you can have multiple first-time I know it sounds weird, but uh, we're going to get into that uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, this is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Hi. Super Talk. This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows granger has got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. We're talking with Brandon Detloff, uh, North Dakota Housing Finance Agency Home Ownership Division Director. And we're talking about first-time homebuyer program, which I, I think is a little misnomer because um, I've used it three times. It's a program that's out there. It's great for North Dakota home ownership opportunities. Um, but how do you get to use the program more than once? Because first-time homebuyer program, but you can use it more than once. It's not your first home, but you get people into houses. Right. Like you said, the, the, the qualification is can't have owned a home in the last three years as your principal residence. Again, if you owned a home and you move and say you're, something happens, you have to move away for work and you come back to North Dakota. Again, if, you, if you're renting for those three years, you qualify again. Like you said, we've had... Or if you keep your home because you moved away and you plan on coming back at some point, but you haven't lived in that house for three years, it's a uh, North Dakota Housing Finance Agency program, first-time homebuyers program, um, you qualify again when mm -hmm. you come back if you've been gone for three years and that's been a rental property. Right. So you know, there's almost a window or an opportunity from a wealth building perspective to, you know, every three years, hey, I should buy a house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, another great thing is if you don't qualify for our first home program, we have another program called North Dakota Roots Program. Um, so our first home program, there are income and acquisition limits. Um, they're dictated to us basically by the IRS. So if you're over those limits for any reason, so maybe your income is over the income limit, you'd qualify under a North Dakota Roots Program. So those loans can go all the way up to the conforming loan limit. Uh, which is about $720,000. You can still do a loan with us. Rates are a little bit different, but still you qualify for down payment, closing cost assistance if you need it. And a bunch of those numbers changed. So they did. Uh, the programs really kind of opened up a little bit because they were lagging behind what actual home prices were. Um, what are the new home price limits? Yeah, so the new price limits for first home, uh, single family home, home, and this is statewide, any county, it's not per county, it goes up to $481,176. Um, yes, it's a very 
odd exact number, but again, that's dictated to us by the IRS and HUD. Um, they have some calculations to do because of the way we fund our loans and their first time home buyer loans. It's limited to a certain, a certain number. Um, so that amount actually jumped about, I think about 28% over last year. It's probably the biggest jump we've ever seen, mm-hmm. which is a great thing. It means there's more homes that qualify. Um, then you also do have to have an income limit and that is based in it per county in the state. So there are different counties, obviously your bigger metro areas have a little higher limit. Just give an idea, like uh, Burley Morton uh, family that goes by less than three or three or more. Again, these are some fun IRS things. Um, 108600 for a family of three or less income. If you're over three or more, it goes up to about 124800 So if you're under those limits, you qualify under first home. If you're over, you'd obviously, anybody qualifies for roots. There are no income acquisition limits. Only up to that conforming loan limit. So if you make $8 million and you want to use our roots program, you can sure do that. Well, tell us a little bit more about the roots program because that, that that's something to attract North Dakotans back to North Dakota and keep people in North Dakota. Yeah, that's originally what it was meant to be. So somebody that was moving back could use this program and then we decided to open it up for anybody. Um, basically what the program was meant to do is those first time home buyers, eventually you're going to need to move up. Um, your family size grows, something happens, you need a bigger home. Um, we created this program to help them move up to another house, still have a great rate, uh, great program, but then it frees up that first-time homebuyer house for another first-time homebuyer. We're trying to continue to keep that that availability of those affordable homes. Yeah, uh, well, and that's what it comes back to is the ability to have affordable homes within a marketplace. And we hear that uh, you know, magic bullet all the time. How do you how do you have affordable home ownership? And, uh, you know, I'm a firm believer there's no magic bullet to it. You can't just throw money at it. Yeah. it it's a process. And, you know, it, basically, it's a function. It's time over equity it is what it is. And, and there's different steps along the way. And that's where the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency comes in with these different programs to help supplement that. Right. So tell us a little bit more about the Roots program, though, uh, as, as far as that's where it started as. Where's it at now? Because you opened it up for everybody, you said. Yeah, it's basically everybody. It used to have some income acquisition limits. Um, I think about two and a half years ago, we got rid of those limits. So us and Bank of North Dakota got together. They were also doing residential mortgages as well. Mm-hmm. We were kind of doing the same thing. The governor said, let's, let's see if we can combine some things, reduce some red tape, so to speak. Um, you know, we kind of had been doing it longer. Bank of North Dakota was looking to kind of get out of the market. So we kind of took over that space for Bank of North Dakota. They were working with a lot of rural lenders because um, it's, it's hard to finance a lot of those rural home, home homes. Um, so we got rid of our income acquisition limits for our roots program. So it doesn't matter what your income is. Acquisition limit, basically the, the only caveat is you just can't go over the conforming loan limit. So, which is about 720,000. So we've seen a few homes, you know, Bismarck Fargo that are, you know, a million, million and a half. They do the 720 with us and then they're doing a second loan with uh, the originating lender for the difference. So there's a lot of different flexibility within that program. And, and, you know, one of the things with the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency is the agency exists entirely to figure out a pathway for home ownership in North Dakota. So... It's kind of interesting because I'm not quite sure if I want to qualify you as a government agency because, again, you're in the business to eliminate the red tape. And that's not usually what government does. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could call us maybe a quasi state. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say because we are technically self funded. We don't take any. Your solutions based, though. Yeah. You're like, we'll find a way. And, um, you know, talk about rural side of things a little bit because there's so many different opportunities out there with USDA loans and yes. different things. But we are a rural state. So um, taking the, the urban side away. Um, there's some different nuances across when you're talking about the rural side of things for home ownership. Yeah, and a big one we hear, especially farmers. Um, you talk about those conforming loans. So a lot of lenders, you know, they'll when they take on a loan, they're probably going to, they have an investor that's probably going to purchase that loan. Usually some of the GSEs, Fannie, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, you've heard of. Um, one thing we found of that's interesting with farmers is when they try to, package those into to, to Fannie or Freddie, um, they don't understand when farmers only earn income for seven months out of the year. Right. To us, that's normal because it's winter. You can't farm in the winter. Last time I checked, um, you can't farm snow, which would be fun <laughs> if you could make some money off it. Well, right? last year they would have made a lot of they money. They would have made a lot yeah. of money. So those are loans that we'll take every day. 
um, you know, it's, you, we just check them to make sure that the income is there. And, but we understand it's seven months out of the year. That's not a problem. Another problem we see is with appraisals. They need comparable properties. Well, if you're on a farm, your most comparable property might be 100 miles away. Well, somebody looking at from Florida doesn't understand yeah. that the next comparable is 100 miles away. Comps are so different. Us, yeah. That's normal being in a rural, you know, rural area. We get that. And again, we'll take those every day. Well, you know, just on the ag side of things too, and we're talking about the farmers, but there's so many people that work in the ag industry mm -hmm. that is seasonal. I, I grew up in the Red River Valley, and I think about people that work at the uh, Crystal Sugar, the sugar beet factories. Those are seasonal jobs. Again, same scenario when you're looking at the incomes. It's like, well, where's the other five months or four months? It, it doesn't exist. Right. So having that understanding of our agrarian and rural economy here in North Dakota, a big benefit for people who are looking at buying homes in North Dakota. We're talking with Brandon Detloff, uh, North Dakota Housing Finance Agency Home Ownership Division Director. When we come back, I want to talk about some of the other programs. Uh, home access, that's a big one. Uh, this is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. This is the story of the Watt. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows granger has got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town, Steve Bakken. We're talking with Brandon Detloff. He is the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency Home Ownership Division Director. And uh, we're talking about some of the different programs uh, with home ownership here in North Dakota that the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency has. Um, one of them is the Home Access Program, um, which is one I'm not that familiar with. You know, the roots I was familiar with, the first time home buyer, um, multiple times but <laughs> but uh, fill us in on the home access side yeah home access is a is a great program and like a lot of our programs i think you know a lot of the public's not familiar with them because it's kind of uh, until they talk with an originating lender they don't know about them um, home access is a great program so if you fall into four different categories so if you're a single parent if you're permanently disabled if you're 65 and over if you're a veteran you qualify for home under home access now people asking well what does that do for me so you still have to meet program parameters as far as income acquisition limit, but you don't have to meet that home first time home buyer requirement. So if you're a single parent and say you say you just got divorced, you sold your home today, tomorrow you qualify under home access because you're a single parent. And that's the, the main driver we see of this program is single parents. Um, I tell the story all the time and probably if somebody's listening, they're going to say, oh, he's telling that story again. We got a letter from... Um, a single mother, she had two kids, wrote us a letter saying that because of this home access program, her kids now have uh, another roof over their head where she doesn't have to take them to the park. She can make dinner, stare out the back window and watch them play in the backyard. And we have a little, little note on there from, from one of her, I think it was her son, said we can finally get a dog. Aww. So they, you know, but again, single parent, again, this is, it, it's helping people get into homes that maybe wouldn't have had a chance to before. Opportunity. It's, opportunity. A, it's, it's about the opportunity. Uh, th that is, you, you could tell that story over and over and over again. That is a great story. But that's the connect. See, I still, I, I, you're not a government agency. <laughs> you got a heart. I, it's, <laughs> I, I, I'm serious. I, you know, getting rid of red tape, getting rid of, uh, you know, as a government agency, sort of, pseudo, quasi, um, but there's a lot of other things that people don't know about because I think one of the things with the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency that people don't understand is, okay, there's a – and I'll say there's a good segment of people that just assume that they're not in a position to own a home. Um, so they're going to be a renter. And you're not going to find out about a lot of the programs that the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency has until you go to buy a house. Well – if your mindset is, I, I'll, I can't qualify, I'm not going to qualify, then you won't know about the programs mm -hmm. because you rely a lot on the lenders, the mortgage lenders and the realtors. But if somebody's not talking to them because they're not thinking that they can go down that path, that's where there's, there's a little bit of a disconnect. 
But it's beyond that because you guys have so many other programs that you need to share that good message with, uh, whether it's on the rental side. You know, it's about building that. You know, I talked a little bit about, um, you know, I, I look at as first time home buyer and, and it, it's a function, it's a mathematical equation. There's a lot of steps along the way that you build that equity over time, and that can be through renting and through uh, manufactured housing and stepping up to that first time uh, that you're putting some sweat equity into that first house that needs a little bit of work. It's a pathway. Um, one of the things that I look at the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency does is you've got different programs to help people along every step of that path quite often. Tell us about some of the other programs that people may not be familiar with. Yeah, most people obviously know us as doing the the home financing, but we're we kind of t- think of ourselves as the state's housing housing experts. Um, we dabble in a little bit of everything. So, you know, other things we deal with is housing development, multifamily development. Um, so there's different financing for um, rehabilitating old rental units or converting them into to low income rental units. Um, some things you might be familiar with here in Bismarck is Edwinton Place down mm-hmm. on Expressway and, and 12th. So. so it's for homeless to get back on their feet. It's kind of a placement facility. They've got services there if they've got addiction problems or whatever. Unbelievable facility. Um, we had we had some work doing with that along with um, the Burley County Housing Authority. Um, another one is Patterson Place downtown. They just did a big renovation. We had some of our projects working on that. And then we also do help with rental assistance. So we administer the Section 8 HUD rental assistance program on behalf of the state. And then just, I think it was a year and a half ago, we took on the uh, continuous care homelessness program. So from soup to nuts, we kind of, everything in between, um, you know, the old saying, uh, a home for everyone and everyone in a home. That's what we strive for every day. That's what we work for every day. Um, we do a little bit of everything. We dabble in everything. Um, you know, each of us are experts in our own field, but together, um, when we come together as one, we can be pretty powerful. You know, that's a message that needs to get out there because it's about putting roofs over people's heads. And there's a lot of ways to help do that. North Dakota Housing Finance Agency, a lot of people are familiar with the first time home buyers, but there's so much more that goes along with that. Um, you know, when we come back from the break, I want to talk a little bit about who's buying houses right now in North Dakota because we see what's going on with the uh, the interest rates. And, and Joe and I talk about this all the time about people, you know, well, you know, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait. Or, you know, the other mindset is like, well, okay, if I buy now, I'm going to be able to refinance. You can't count on what those numbers are going to look like. Um, and one of the things that the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency does a really good job at is building in stability to home ownership, whatever that might look at, whatever program it might be, that is the first and foremost thing. You you want somebody successful in home ownership. Correct. Absolutely. Um, a successful homeowner is, uh, is a great homeowner. Um, I think our track record shows, you know, we service all our loans locally. Um, you can look at our delinquency foreclosure rates. They're they're lower than the national average. Our, our, our loans are probably a little bit riskier because they're first-time home buyers. They have higher, you know, lower credit scores, higher debt to income ratios. Um, but it's our staff and how we communicate with our borrowers that we know if there's problems, we work through them, we can figure them out. Um, we're not here to, to beat up on people. We want you to stay in the home. We want you to be successful and we're going to do everything we can to keep you in it. Well, and that's my point. I, I want you to highlight that a little bit because you, you talk about those riskier loans, which um, you put people into a position quite often that they, from a traditional lender, they may not qualify. You, you help in that mm-hmm. space. Uh, so that is tending to be a little bit more riskier loan. But like you said, your delinquency rates are lower than the national average. So you're doing something right. Yes. So talk about the delinquency rates because we see across the country, and I, I was just reading an article this last week that they're starting to spike up a little bit mm-hmm. because of the interest rates. Mm-hmm. You know, people who may have gotten into arms and and because that's the other stopgap. It's, hey, I can get into an arm so I get a lower interest rate. But you guys really try to put together the package that you're going to be a successful homeowner, which means you're going to be there for the long haul. You're not going to get into a position where uh, you're going to maybe get into a foreclosure or a delinquency. Um, Talk about that for a little bit, because that's important. Yeah, I mean, you look at our, I'll just go into our foreclosure rate. I mean, it's it's like splitting hair. So our, for, our, our foreclosure right now is a half of 1%, which is absolutely ridiculous. Phenomenal. It's ridiculous. 
uh, again, some of that has to do with where we live. You know, we're, we're fairly conservative states. So everybody likes to pay their bills. I always like to go back to, I don't like talking about the pandemic, but when that happened in March of 2020 and everything came out with people can go on fair forbearances, um, and a lot of people were. We didn't know what was going to happen. You know, a lot of our loans, we service our FHA loans. So, you know, different regulations come out from the federal government of what we can do with FHA loans. The forbearances came out. We didn't know what was going to happen in, in two weeks, three weeks, a month. Everything was changing every week. So we told our borrowers, if you can make your payment, make it, because we don't know what options are going to be available if you go on forbearance. There was a huge spike nationwide of delinquencies, because mm-hmm. if you're on forbearance, they're considered delinquency. Ours actually, our delinquency rate actually went down during COVID because people didn't know what was going on. So they were just going to start making their payment, wow. which I think is is unbelievable. But yes, you're correct. We have started seeing um, nationwide a tick up in foreclosure and delinquency rates. Uh, ours hasn't. We're actually lower now than we were pre-COVID. We're talking with Brandon Detloff. He is the Home Ownership Division Director at North Dakota Housing Finance Agency. This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. 1270. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bakken. We're talking with Brandon Detloff, North Dakota Housing Finance Agency, Home Ownership Division Director. And uh, I want to come back and, and kind of wrap up on who's buying homes because we've seen across the rest of the country a little bit lull in some of the markets um, with the interest rates going up. What are we seeing in North Dakota? Where, where are those numbers at? Are, are we seeing a slowdown in North Dakota? Because one of the things I look at is inventory. And we, we're we not gaining any inventory. Um, so with a growing population, what does that mean for home ownership? What are you seeing in North Dakota compared to across the rest of the country? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, when the beginning of the year started, obviously January, February tend to be a little slow for us. It's it's winter. Nobody wants to move in the win- middle of winter nope. just after just after Christmas, right? So usually once spring hits, we start, you know, beginning of March, end of March, we start to see that climb back up again where people are out looking, people are um, buying homes again. We didn't see that this year. Um, we attributed it at the time to there was too much snow on the ground. People are still not moving because I think, what was it, mid-June before the snow melted? Um, July, something yeah, like that. Something yeah, something like that. might still be there somewhere. <laughs> um, even into April was slow. So we were starting to get a little nervous, like, okay, what's this market doing? Obviously, we saw you know rates double from where they were. Um, you know, went from 25 3% all the way up to, you know, 6 And now they're, you know, they're touching 7 now. So... We thought, okay, is there a shock in the market? And I think there was a little bit of a shock in the market. So, you know, April came, it was slow. May started to pick up a little bit for us. Uh, June was even better. Um, July was even better. We just set a record in July for reservations coming in, um, which I think a lot of people, what they're realizing now is, I think the beginning of the year, they're going to sit and wait thinking, okay, these rates are going to come back down. Let's wait until they come back down. But they're going to stay here for a while. They, I don't see them going anywhere for a while. You know, if I had a crystal ball, um, you know, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. Um, <laughs> you would have got that Mega Millions last week. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm hearing now they're saying maybe the fall, they're going to drop a little bit, but they're not going back down to three like they were again. I think they're going to, you know, somewhere in the five and a half probably six range is probably where it's eventually going to fall. Well, and Joe and I have talked about this. Traditionally, it, it, it's five and a half to six and a half. So we were in an artificially depressed interest rate and people who bought homes were the benefactors of that. Yeah. Uh, but you also weren't gaining money in savings and CDs and, and, and other avenues. So the equity in your home, that was a great opportunity to do that. That opportunity is still there because the rates aren't going in. Getting into that home is probably the best way for most people to build wealth. And it's the equity in the home because housing prices aren't coming down either. No, no. And you know, one of the problems we're seeing now is those that bought during the pandemic at, at 3% they're not going anywhere. You know, we're expecting them, on average, we see our loans turn over about every six to eight years. Those at 3%, 2.5%, 
they're not going anywhere for a long time. They're going to remodel their house and stay there at 3%. They're not going anywhere. So that's affecting inventory. They're refusing to move, which I don't blame them at that low interest rate, how affordable their payment is. So that's affecting, it's not as much inventory coming on the market. So that's that's going to be a few years until, you know, how long is that going to take to work its, work its way through the system? It's going to take a while. Well, then through COVID and the backside of COVID, you saw supply chain issues. So lumber prices went through the roof. If you could get lumber or siding or fixtures and things like that, which really caused a little, uh, another lag in the housing market. So, um, you know, builders couldn't keep up with what they were previously building. The price went up on materials. Um, that all played into it as well. So now you've got a bunch of people that are sitting on, you know what, I kind of like this interest rate. Mm -hmm. But we also have a growing population, so the demand is still there. Right. So where do you see things for the rest of the year from the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency? Because record last month and, and that part's not slowing down. No, the first time home buyer segment, you know, there's always going to be, there's always going to be production. Because that for five and a half homebuyers. percent rate looks pretty it's, damn good with the North really Dakota good. Housing Finance it, it, Agency. I almost don't want to tell everybody about it. We're going to get too much production. We're nowhere okay, going to be able to keep up. Shh, we didn't say that. No, really. Right, use yeah. it. If you need to use it, use it. <laughs> it's fine. We'll find more money. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, that's really our the thing we try to do is keep that interest rate as low as possible. Um, we don't, like I said, I don't want to go into the weeds too much, but we really were limited on the amount of income we can make because of the first time homeowner. There's some, there's some rules there. So if we make too much money, we have to send the IRS a check. So we keep these as low as possible because we don't want to make money and send it to the IRS. We'd rather have the borrowers have the benefit of a lower payment. Um, but that's really where they need help right now with that lower payment you know, from a three to a 7%, what did that do to somebody's payment? Yeah. So from seven to five and a half, that can be the make or break yeah. of somebody getting into a home or not. Two, 300 bucks a month. It's it's, easy. It's, it's huge. Um, so again, if, if, like I said, and I can't stress this enough, if, if you've thought that maybe you're not a candidate for home ownership, that's what the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency is there for. And so a lot of people that maybe don't think about being a candidate for home ownership who won't talk to a realtor, won't talk to a mortgage lender because they don't think they qualify. How do they reach out to you guys and find out what's out there to go, hey, maybe this is an option? Yeah, best place to start to visit our website, www.ndhfa.org, so abbreviation for North Dakota Housing Finance Agency. Um, you can click on that. It says a link that says ready to, ready to buy a home. Um, basically, it's a step-by-step -step what you need to do Shows our originating participating lenders, shows a, a group of them by city. You can pick one. Obviously, you can talk to multiple. If you, you, know, if you don't like the first one you talk to, go to another one. Tells you how to find real estate agents that we work with that are approved to use our programs, that are knowledgeable about our programs. Also, home buyer education is huge. If you're a first-time home buyer, best thing you can do is gain as much knowledge you can about the like process. Like I said, speed dial. I was on the phone a lot, and you know what? At the time... The director picked up sometimes yeah. and answered the phone. I'm like, wow, this is kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. We don't, you know, we don't have uh, 80 to 100 people. We're a pretty small shop, and uh, we like to say we're all knowledgeable enough to be dangerous. But yeah, I, I get calls all the time. Um, that's what we're here for. We're here to help. But visit our website. There's some great programs on there. If you have questions about our programs, call us. Um, we can get you in touch with lenders or figure out what the process is. Um, we can't tell you if you qualify or not because obviously the lender has to pull some credit reports, that kind of thing, verify income. Um, we can tell you what the limits are and you can kind of see based on what you think your limit is and see if you qualify. But if you didn't think home ownership was an option, it probably is. And talk to the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency to find out more. Brandon, thanks for coming in today. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Brandon Detloff, uh, the Home Ownership Division Director of North Dakota Housing Finance Agency. This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. If you can make money on it, it can be taxed. I'm Daria Albinger with today's tax tip. Anytime you make a profit on something, the tax man wants his cut, including your investments. Capital gains are basically from the profits you make from selling most assets. And we're talking about stocks. We're talking about cryptocurrency. Anytime you sell an asset, you're going to pay capital gains taxes. Caleb Silver, editor-in-chief at Investopedia, says there are two kinds. Here's one. The gains you make from selling those assets that you've held for less than a year are called short-term capital gains. And they're generally taxed at the same rate as your ordinary income, anywhere from that 10% income threshold to the 30 
67% threshold. Here's the other. Gains you make from the sale of assets you've held for more than a year are called long-term capital gains, and they're typically taxed at a lower rate than those short-term gains, somewhere between 0% if you're low income, up to 20% if you're in the higher income bracket. You can learn more about capital gains at irs.gov or on the app irs to go with today's tax tip, Daria Albinger, ABC News. Talk of the town. Welcome to the School for Startups Minute with Jim Beach. Good communication skills are so important to a successful career and a happy relationship. All this week, we are talking about how to have better communication skills. Yesterday, I suggested practice and preparation. I'll give you another piece of advice right after this. This is Dr. Michael Garko for Strauss Naturals. It is not until they have urinary flow or urinary tract problems that men really pay attention to their prostate. Rather than wait for problems to occur, I recommend Strauss Naturals Prostate Support Drops. The Prostate Support Drops is a blend of naturally sourced herbs to support a healthy prostate, urinary system, and urinary flow. All Strauss Natural products are backed by 100% satisfaction guarantee. Visit StraussNatural.com to learn more and order the Prostate Support Drops today. There is an instructive Dale Carnegie story about a time he met a famous New York industrialist. They had a long conversation, and afterwards, the industrialist said that Dale Carnegie was the best conversationalist in the whole world. Dale was asked about this, and he said, yes, during the conversation, I asked him several questions, and he talked the rest of the time. To engage in successful conversations, you need to start off practicing active listening. Stop thinking about what you are going to say next and just listen. KLXX Mandan Bismarck, a Town Square media station, broadcasting from the View Community Credit Union Studio. This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.